We have a special today, so, and then think of uh, uh, your favorite song you'd like to sing. Thank you. 425. 425. In the garden. Who does the rendition of this? God. Yeah, that's just... It's awesome. Okay. All right.
Greg. 196. 196? 186, the old rugged cross. <clears throat> yep.
Testing. Getting there. Can you hear me? Okay. in a song, can't you? Yes, yes. You really can. More than, um, more than a speaker ever could. I think music does that kind of power. It really has an awesome power. So we're very appreciative of our musicians and what they do and the, the message, the gospel message that comes out from, from that. I think it's awesome. 
Well, today we're going to conclude our look at the case of the new heaven and the new earth. The case of the new heaven and the new earth is what we're calling it. A quick review from part one, which we did a couple weeks ago. Test question. What is, what is the origin of the word utopia? Anybody remember? Yeah. Greek. No place. No place. Yes. It's a combination of Greek words that in the English actually means no place. It doesn't exist. Uh, but yet it caught on. It caught on big time. And uh, it's a non-existent society that lives only in our dreams. And, uh, and what, um, what Elizabeth was singing about today was a, a society, a utopian society, as we use the word utopia, that does exist. That it's out there. We're just looking for it to come. Uh, and the Lord has given us some clues about those things uh, uh, in, in the scriptures. And that's why we're going through this series on heaven. To catch a, to catch a, um, uh, a glimpse of it, maybe, uh, to light our souls on fire as we think about what the Lord has for us out there. But why has this concept captured our imaginations uh, of millions throughout the course of human history? Well, I, I think it, it has, there's some kind of built-in sense within us that, that Elizabeth was singing about that anywhere we are, it's not what I'm actually looking for. I, I, I have this inner thing now within me that says, I want what God has for me. I want that. And uh, wherever that is, and we know that it is, it's in heaven. It's the new Jerusalem, the new heaven, the new earth, eternity with our God. That's, where it, that's what feels like home to us. That's what we strive for. That's what we're longing for. But, and, I, and this yearning that's within us, I believe, is a, is a call from our Creator. It's something that is put within us. And Gus's reading of what we call the Lord's Prayer, some call it the Disciples' Prayer. It's not a name for it. But there is one phrase in Matthew 6:10: Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. I think it's a cry from the heart for what's out ahead of us. That's what it is. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done here as it is in heaven. Well, will that ever happen? Yes. Will it happen today? No. But that's part of God's plan. And we're going to get to that here in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and I'll explain maybe a little bit about this yearning within our hearts for a bit more uh, of what we have here. When we study the millennial kingdom, that's yet to come. Uh, it's a very exciting study for me, and I'm really enjoying it. I hope, well, I, I'll just be honest with you. I will be inadequate to bring to you what the full word of God says about that subject. We're going to look at it from a higher level, 10,000 foot, and, uh, but I would sure recommend you take that, the, the seed that will be planted with the word there, and take it and run with it. And do your own investigation. But today we're going to continue our study about a place that in the Greek we have named Tis tapas, which means what? Some place. Tis is the Greek word for some, and tapas means place. Uh, where we get our English word topology, some place. Like the only place. What's that? The only place. The only place, that's right. Uh, and we're going to look at what the Bible says about the new heaven and the new earth. This is part two, and it is, a, it is our last part in this particular part of our look at heaven. But in God's master plan and timeline, okay, uh, he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth along with the city, the new Jerusalem. Now, one of the things I really like about this is, as a, uh, and spending a lot of my life as an engineer, I like to have a plan. I like to build to a plan. I like all that stuff. It's, that's how I function. So when we, when, we, uh, when we do things, I like to know where we're going. And one thing that the Lord has done for us is he has laid out his plan for the ages for us to see in the scriptures, which I think is awesome. I think it's just awesome. And I realize that some of you may not have heard of or studied some of these things we're talking about. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, all that. And, and about the upcoming events. But... Once you catch a, a, a kind of a sense for this, a flavor for this, uh, you'll be wanting to see all these things happen. You really will. You'll be wanting to see these things happen. So if you have questions about our study, just let me know. I'd be glad to sit down and, and, uh, and let you know what I think as far as the scriptures go and what I think God has got for us out there. Uh, There's a plan. Uh, in, when I got saved, I had no idea that there was stuff beyond getting saved. What more could you ever want? 
only to find out that there's a whole lot more out there. And it's pretty awesome. So my goal uh, in this part of our study on heaven is to make you so excited uh, about all of this that you actually, uh, and I've said this before, that you become real estate agents. You go out into the world and invite people to reserve their spot in this great thing that's coming. You know, as we see this all about it, in the men's meeting this morning, we, we looked at the other side, uh, and, and, and that's just as, I mean, as happy as we are about heaven, there is the hell part. There is the other side, and that is a place nobody should want to go. It'll be horrible. Uh, it's the opposite of heaven. So we want them to be looking at us as being so excited about where we're going that they want in on this too. Yes. They want in on this too. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 19, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most miserable. If in this life only we have hope, we're of all men most miserable. I assure you that is not the case. We not only have hope in this life, we have hope in the life to come. And what does hope mean in the scriptures? Confident expectation. Confident expectation. Confidence. We are confident in our God. So in the course of this studies, I want you to find that real hope. Hope in, in this life, because you have hope in the life to come. It's kind of like being backward engineered. We have hope in the life to come, therefore I have hope in this life where I'm at. I want you to be able to rejoice in everything about him, in his light, uh, in the day of Christ, in your position in Christ, uh, even in your sufferings. And we have many of that family struggling right now uh, amongst our folks here and our extended folks that we know outside of our church. Uh, a lot of families are really struggling right now. Um, but we want you to have hope. There's a better situation coming. It's awesome on the other side. The stuff that folks face here won't even be thought of there. Two weeks ago we saw that there are primarily two writers in the New Testament uh, that speak to us about the new heaven and the new earth. Anybody remember who they are? They were buds. They did much together. Yes, sir? Peter and John. Peter and John. Yeah. Peter and John. It's an awesome study just to look at what they did together. And uh, we looked at their relationship and how that affected their writings. Peter would write this just prior to his death in about 68 AD, 2 Peter 3.13. We, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. John would write this just prior to his own death in about 100 AD. He would say in Revelation 21.1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. They would both write about the same thing. And I think as they, as they got together and they ministered to the Lord together, a lot of their time was spent talking about this subject. Thus it should be for us. These, these subjects that we're looking at in heaven ought to be the things that sustain us while we're here. They knew about this concept of the new heaven and the new earth, and uh, it was presented to them, I think, as they walked with the Lord Jesus in a lot of their conversations. But they also knew that the prophet Isaiah, long before they wrote about it themselves, took pen in hand, and in Isaiah 65, 17, he said, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered nor come to mind. Isn't that an awesome statement that Isaiah made? And then in Isaiah 66, 22, he says, For as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. So in these two verses, Isaiah presents a commitment from God. It's a commitment from God. He's going to create new heavens and a new earth. So then, what will this new heaven and the new earth be like? And that's what we've been studying. How can he describe this place? Anybody seen a documentary that starred John Wayne called Big Jake? <laughs> have you seen it? You have seen it. You remember in the bad, the bad guy, he's looking at this chest. And you know what it's full of, right? Paper clippings. But he thinks there's a million dollars in there. And John Wayne looked at him and he says, that's the stuff dreams are made of. And the guy's all glee. I can tell you, that may be true for the villain of that documentary, but not for us. For us, the things dreams are made of are what's out ahead of us, as the Lord will fulfill those desires in our heart as we get there. Remember one of the questions on the worksheet that we had? What was one of those questions? It was, if you 
What would it be that you'd want there to be there when you get there? Let your imagination go. And I bet as you're writing it, the Lord is saying, I'll make note of that. I'll make sure it's here. Be it the finest fishing hole in the world or, or whatever your, de your desire is, uh, I bet he will make that happen. So we're going to look at today the case of the promise of the new heaven and new earth. In part one of this study, we looked at scriptures from the book of Hebrews uh, that Elizabeth sang about. I'm searching for a city, a nation, a country, a lot of vernacular used there about the promise of the new heaven and the new earth. Here's one of them, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 10. He says, And thou, Lord, in the beginning hast laid the foundation of the earth. So the Lord has literally erected the earth. That's what that means. He has erected the earth. And the heavens are the works of thine hand. So with his own hands he built the heavens. They shall perish, meaning they'll die. This existing earth and the heavens will die. But thou remains, and they all shall wax old as doth a garment, and as a vesture shalt thou fold them up, and they shall be changed. But thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. So the passage tells me two things about the new heaven and the new earth. There's probably more there, but I'm just saying two for now. And that's that the existing heavens and earth are compared to an old set of clothes uh, that lose their usefulness and have to be changed. So they're folded up and put away, and a new set replaces. And he says, but thou, so God, but thou, Lord, are the same. So in all of this change stuff that's going to take place, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, the Lord does not change throughout all that process. He is constant. He will stay the same. He will stay the course throughout it. God will never change. He will never change his plan. He won't get into this halfway and say, you know, I think I'm going to go in a different direction. You ever work for a guy who does that to you? It's awful. So then you have to go off and, and, and on a new engineering path, probably in software. They said, so I wanted to do this. But then you get halfway through your development. They said, you know, it'd be nice if it does this too. And then that gets added. And then, yeah, welcome to the IT engineering world, uh, most branches. So all of this preparation work leads us to the main passage on this subject which is Revelation 21 and 22. And we're going to look at, let's go to Revelation 21.1. Revelation 21.1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. So all this is happening... Revelation 21, 1 and 2, new heaven, new earth, uh, all that stuff. The old, the first are passed away and there's no more seed. A very logical question, I think, as I look at this would be, why will this happen? Why will this happen? So to answer that, uh, uh, why is there even a, a need for a new heaven and earth? Why not continue with what exists today? Why not do that? Well, it ultimately goes back to the destruction that sin brought into God's creation. The new heaven and the new earth, there's a reason that must be. And it goes all the way back to the bookend of the scriptures, Genesis chapter 3 and verse 17. Why a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem? Well, Genesis 3.17 has some of that answer. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree, of which I commanded you, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it, Cursed is the ground. Cursed is the ground. So not just within the garden. Cursed is the ground, but that's over the earth. That is the heavens and the earth. Sin had that kind of impact when it was introduced into humanity. Even the ground was cursed. I don't know if you've thought about that. As I've studied through this, I've gotten a, a, a better vision of what sin has done to us. Sin has destroyed us. It has not just destroyed humanity. It has destroyed the world around us. It is that desperately evil. That's what he's saying here. It's destroyed the ground as well. So the introduction of sin to the environment caused a change even in the way that the natural world works. Not just man, but every bit of creation was affected and infiltrated with the results of this sin. The negative effect of sin in the world is staggering. It is absolutely staggering. Uh, that's what sin did. If you study Romans chapter 
uh, 7, verses 19 through 22, uh, and chapter 8 as well. On this subject, you're going to see at least three things about sin. Number one, against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. All creation was subjected to God's curse. You know, that's what happened. And number two, the creation eagerly looks forward to the day when it will join God's children uh, in freedom from death and decay. It looks forward to that too. And number three, all creation has been growing as in the pain of childbirth right up to the present time. So sin didn't stop with Adam and Eve and it didn't just kind of trickle down through humanity. Sin spread all around us. As I said, the negative effect of sin on our world is staggering. It is staggering. So God will fix this for all eternity with the new heaven and the new earth. It's a must-do thing. It's a must-do thing. So to understand why a new heaven and a new earth, we've got to understand the impact that sin had when Adam and Eve fell in the garden. As I say, it didn't just stop with them. This became a, uh, a, a what would you say, a wildfire? We're going to look into that subject more, into sin, uh, what it is, why it's so bad, and what impact it, it, it has on us on Wednesday night, this coming Wednesday night, as we look at our study on the Sermon on the Mount. So I would encourage you to be there for that. It, it's quite the, uh, uh, quite the look, I hope. Uh, and then we'll talk about uh, our things I wish I had known a long time ago regarding sin. Uh, this coming Wednesday night and, and may ultimately help you to develop, I hope, uh, uh, a, a personal or family plan to walk more holy before God. That will be our goal for our Wednesday night study. So we conclude that the, the introduction of sin into our world devastated it and it has to be corrected as we head into eternity. It has to be corrected because uh, it's continuing to come apart. Have you noticed that about our earth? <laughs> It's, it's continuing to, uh, to come apart. And, and uh, what, was the, what was that way? It just keeps falling apart. And God has to fix it. I remember when we... Granny had a gulch down below her, her, her home. And we used to go down there. It, it was a channel cut by a water stream. And it was probably 30 feet tall, I guess. And... Um, uh, at the end of it is a bowl and then rocks around the upper edge as the waterfall goes over when water's running. And uh, they were there when they were, she, she and her sister were there and her sister was sitting on a rock looking over the edge and they came back, was it a week later? And the rock she had been sitting on was now in the bottom of that pit. Things keep falling apart. Uh, they, they do, they're, they're, they're not holding together. So he needs to fix that. So that's why the new heaven and the new earth. Any thoughts on that before we go into the next question? When will this happen? Have you got the why part down? It just needs to be replaced. It's like driving a Chevy. You have to get a four. You know, at some point, it's just going to happen. So, it's just the way it is. Or so, the other way. Huh? Or the other way, four to a Chevy. Uh, no. <laughs> All of you will be humble. <laughs> so, uh, so when will this happen is always then the next question. Okay, I understand why. Because sin has destroyed us and it has to be fixed. Well, when will this happen? When does the new heaven and the new earth happen chronologically in God's plan of engineering for eternity? When are we out there? Okay, so it happens, it is after, uh, it's at the end of God's plan. I'll just start there, okay, and then go back to the beginning. It's after the rapture, it's after the Bema Seat judgment of the church, it's after the great tribulation and the battle of Armageddon, it's after the second advent or the second coming of Christ, and it's after the thousand year millennial reign. Okay, so we're up to that point. It's after the great white throne judgment. At that point, boom, he creates the new heaven and the new earth the new Jerusalem, as we enter eternity. In God's timeline of engineering, that's when it happens. Okay, so it will come at the, I guess you could say at the end of our time or at the beginning of eternity, whichever you prefer. You know, however you prefer to look at this. So that's the when. And then another question always is how. Okay, we got the why, the when, now we'll look at the how. How about this new heaven and the new earth? I don't believe that the, that the Lord is going to, you know, thoroughly wipe out every bit of the old and start from scratch. I don't think that's how he does it. 
uh, there's a lot of evidence to say otherwise. I believe the Lord is going to create the new heaven and the new earth by renovating, overhauling, refurbishing, reconstructing, and I couldn't think of any more our words to throw in there, the old heaven and the earth. Okay? Renovating, overhauling, refurbishing, reconstituting. Uh, it's like what we do uh, in when we were in the Boundary Waters. Is Izzy here? We reconstituted these little packs of food, didn't we? Pour water and it reconstitutes. So you know, it, it makes it what it was. Makes it what it was intended to be. Have you ever had freeze-dried um, eggs? Yeah, only once. They don't serve that over there. But let's look at the evidence for this thought, that he's going to rejuvenate what is here. Uh, and at the end of my list of what I consider to be evidence, I have my main reason for why I think this is important. So we're working as a chacrendo toward our great delivery in the end, okay? So let's look at the evidence. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 10. He says, but the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So what should that tell us? We don't know what's coming. We don't know what's coming, so be ready at any time. Uh, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Does that sound like a good time? No, it sounds bad, right? But the phrase burned up, the last couple of words of, of verse 10, shall be burned up. That literally means to be laid bare or exposed. And it pictures being uncovered. It isn't a matter of utter destruction, but of stripping everything away that, and getting back to the original elements is what that word means. Uh, you do this when you refinish an old dresser. Uh, you take off, you sand down... Uh, all of the layers of stuff that's on it until you get back to the original structure, what it was when it was started. And that's where the Lord, that's what he means when it says it will be burned up. The stuff will be taken off. And it'll appear to be more of a, to me when I look at this, it's not an annihilation. It's actually a purification, a cleaning up of what's there. It's going to be purified. And God will once more, I believe, exercise his great creative power to recreate the universe, the new heavens and the new earth, out of what's here, stripping off the bad, keeping what was there originally, and that was intended for good, and then rebuilding from there. Uh, and there's a reason for that. There's a reason I think that, and like you say, I'm working toward that. And he did all this once, he can do it again. We can trust him to do it again. Now, in your, in your worksheet, there is the full quote by Dr. W. A. Criswell. I'm just going to read part of it here today. He was a very prominent preacher in our country uh, in a past generation. He says, out of this purged mass of God's creative work, he will reshape, he will remake, he will recreate all of the heavens and this earth. There will be no destruction of what God has made. It is a renewal. It is a renaissance. It is a regeneration. It is a recreation. Now, is that more ours than I ever could come up with? This guy is awesome. He is a genius. Yes, sir. The question online about what's the difference between the new heaven and the current heaven. Oh, okay. Well, there are, there are three. Remember when we went back? What is the difference? What are the heavens he's talking about? Remember the three heavens we studied, oh, what, two, three months ago? You've got the atmosphere around the earth. You've got, that is the first heaven. The scriptures call that the first heaven. The second heaven is the, um, the stars, the atmosphere around us. Those two layers are going to be recreated in a new heaven, as the new heaven. Now the third heaven, as Paul talks about in Corinthians, he was taken up into the third heaven, is in the very presence of God. Do you think that needs to be renovated? I don't think so. No, no sin is allowed in his presence there. So we're not talking third heaven, but when we talk new heaven, it is the first and the second heaven. Yes, sir, great. I thought that one also had to be re re uh, done because Satan was there and God cannot be in presence of any sin. So it was under the impression that one also was renovated. Right he won't be there then. Right, then, yeah, but he's right. been there. He's been there. And he's been, it's funny, too, that, that he would even allow him there to do what he does. What's he doing there right now, by the way? 
Accusing who? Us. All of us. Us. Everybody. Yeah. And the whole reason why he's having to renovate the earth is if you take it on to an aspect of radiation, right? Mm -hmm. The different nuclear accidents that it has had, life cannot uh, attain it. Right. So you have to have new. And the earth will become so contaminated with sin we that you are. can't live here. Yeah. Yeah, we already are. Yeah. But he's focusing primarily with the new heaven and the new earth, not, as, not in his own presence, but in the layers that are affected by sin itself. And that is those first two. Um, I think this guy, Chriswell, does a good job as he's explaining it. Uh, so if, you, if you've got your worksheet and you want to read the whole quote, that's the spot to go. So you've got, you've got it all there. Here's another clue. Besides being burnt up, uh, as we explained, it doesn't mean annihilated. It actually means rejuvenated, is in Revelation 21.5. And, uh, and, and he that sat upon the throne, uh, which we know is who? Jesus Christ. Said, behold, I make all things new. So the word new is significant. I make all things new. There are two Greek words for the word new. One is neos, and that contains the idea of creating something from nothing. Or, uh, or new in terms of time. It wasn't before, now it is. That is not the Greek word that John used here. He, word, he used the word kianos, which suggests newness in terms of quality. It's a big difference. Uh, so this is the word John used of the, of the new creation at the end of the age here. Not utter destruction, but utter transformation. Kianos. Just to give you some insight into that word kianos, it's also the same word that Paul uses in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, when he wrote that if we are in Christ, we are a new creation. It's the same word. It's the same idea. So a new convert, when I got saved, was I completely destroyed? No, I wasn't. I was totally transformed. I was totally transformed. Uh, can you imagine preaching a gospel? Like if you went to somebody who you wanted to witness the gospel to and you, you tell them that if they will only accept Christ, they will be totally destroyed. <laughs> no, that's deans. You, know, that, that, you know, that's creating something entirely new. No, what he's talking about there with the word kianos is that they are, we, we preach total transformation, not total annihilation. <laughs> it's a big difference. It's a great gospel message, right? I want you to get saved. You'll not live through the experience, but I want you to do it. <laughs> you know? uh, so that's the difference between those words. Uh, so that's why I think when he says, I make all things new, he's suggesting new in terms of quality. I'm gonna purge the bad, get rid of the bad, keep what he originally intended for good and make it into what he wants to then. Another clue for us is found in Revelation 21.1 uh, also. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. This word passed away, parachromi, uh, probably doesn't mean two chromines, okay? So don't be confused by the Greek. Parachromi there, okay? It means, it doesn't mean to cease to exist, but to change form, to go from one state to another. And it actually, the word is, uh, that's used for man, like if you walk through the door, that door back there, you go from one room to the other. That's what parachromi says. William Hendrickson, again, I'm gonna read you a part of this quote. Uh, you have it on your worksheet. The first heaven and the first earth have passed away. In our imagination, let's try to see this new universe. The very foundations of the earth have been subjected to purifying fire. That's what he's talking about with the burned away, purifying fire. Every stain of sin, every trace of death has been removed. That's purged. That is gone. It's like working on a car and you, 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 you have to get the old paint off. If you leave any paint on that frame, what happens to the new paint? It bubbles up. Yeah, it doesn't stick well. It, it creates problems. When he talks here purging, purging fire, all the sin is gone. Every stain of sin, every trace of death has been removed. Out of the great conflagration, a, uni a new universe has been born. The word used in the original implies that it was a, a new, but not an other world. It is the same heaven and earth, but gloriously rejuvenated with no weeds, thorns, or thistles, and so on. So when I speak of uh, a loved one, say, passing away, 
my loved one passing passes away. I don't mean to say that they are now non-existent, do I? They're in a different form. They're in a different form. They have simply moved from one state to another. All these weeds and everything, you know the only good thing that ever came of all that? Guts. My job. In your job. That's right. Right. It has created a whole industry <laughs> for the gusses of the world. Well, here's another clue for us in this case. Peter compared the transition from the old creation to the new creation to Noah's flood. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 5. Here Peter says, By the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Think about this. Was the world of Noah's day destroyed? Was the world destroyed? Well, the people were. Right. Was the world destroyed? No. No. Uh, it was cleansed. It was purified. And the entire world changed as the judgment of God came on it. No doubt about that. No doubt. But the essential elements making up the earth were not annihilated. They're still there. Yeah. God didn't obliterate them. What did he do? He renovated it. He cleaned up the mess. Cleaned up the mess. So Peter, in using Noah to tell us how this is going to work, uses a very good example, a real-world example, on how the process was taken about. So in the same way, God is not going to cause the present earth to cease to exist. The fire that he's going to use is going to renovate the earth far more effectively uh, than the water ever did. It's going to be, uh, wow, it's going to be wow. Some even believe that the New Jerusalem, by the way, at that time, is going to be kind of like our ark of safety while the Lord is doing all this. All us believers will be in the New Jerusalem, and that will be our ark of the day. I don't know if that's true, but it's kind of a cute thought, isn't it? Uh, that will be there. Another quote from uh, Ms. Dr. Criswell, and I'm not going to read the whole thing. You've got it in your notes. He says, there's no evidence that any atom God ever originally created ever is annihilated ever. Right? God made all of you uh, see in matter. Uh, God made all you see in matter in the beginning. It is never added to. It is never taken away from. If God ever creates a thing, it extends itself forever. For example, your soul. When a soul is created, Ecclesiastes twelve seven says the body returns to the dirt just as it was. It doesn't cease to be. It still is. It is just in another form. Uh, and the spirit returns unto God who gave it. So the spirit goes up. No thing God ever made is ever destroyed. So the new heaven and the new earth are renovated. They are remade. And again, as I'm working toward my chicrendo of why I think this is just an awesome thing that the Lord has done. But the inquire quote, entire quote there is in your worksheet. There is one more reason, and this is it for me, as I look at this uh, to believe that the new heaven and the new earth are renovated. Uh, that means much to me. Really, it does. I don't believe God intends to give Satan the satisfaction of having totally ruined his creation. Mm -hmm. I don't believe God will give Satan the satisfaction. Thank Lord. Yeah. yeah. What God created. What did God say about what he created? It is, it is, it good. is good. It is good. What he created is good. I rejoice in the thought that our great God would never let somebody come in and so totally ruin his creation that even God can't put it back together. You know? Uh, to me, we are telling Satan, you lost. You didn't win that. You lost. Uh, in Genesis 1.31, God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. It was very good. I don't believe God ever changed his mind about what he said. What he made, what he did was good. What sin did, what we did, what humanity does, is not. So I believe his purpose for redeeming the world uh, was not to abandon his creation, but to restore it. To restore it. If Satan could so totally devastate the world that even God couldn't fix it, wouldn't that be a victory for Satan? Yes. I said, in my view, it would. But the Lord is telling Satan, you didn't win even that. You didn't even win that. 
There's nothing this guy has won. I just don't see that happening. I don't see Satan winning anything anywhere. Randy Alcorn in his book on heaven says this, God doesn't throw away his handiwork and start from scratch. Instead, he used the same canvas to repair and make more beautiful the, pa the, the painting marred by the, the painting marred by the vandal. The vandal doesn't get the satisfaction of destroying his rival's masterpiece. On the contrary, God makes an even greater masterpiece out of what his enemy sought to destroy. That's how I see this playing out. God takes what Satan meant for evil and makes it even into greater good than it ever was in the beginning. That's what we have ahead of us. That's what we, there will be no sin, no disease, no death. There will be nothing to bust us apart or to destroy things. All that is gone. We'll never have to quit because we ran out of daylight or it got too hot or too cold. We'll never have to. So how many times have you had to quit there, Tim, uh, with the fencing business because it just got too hot on a 60-year-old body? Yeah. So there are, th there are some things that made me scratch my head as I looked at this new heaven and new earth. And the first one that I want to call your attention to um, as I drink a little heavenly elixir is in Revelation 21.1. Let's look at that phrase there. Revelation 21.1. Um, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. That last phrase, and there was no more sea. I'm thinking, as I look at John, and we, we see in his writings, we see a guy who 2,000 years ago did not have the vernacular you and I have today. He is writing to this thing in, in his own mind, in the language of his time. Like, for instance, as he looked at the new, the new Jerusalem, he says, hey, wait a minute. There's no candles. What's going on? And there's no sun. Where is the light coming from? Where is the power plant? And, of course, it was the Lord Jesus himself. So when he, when he, when he looks at this, this is almost a, a shocking statement. He's looking around, expecting to see something. Expecting to see the source of the light as he knew a source of light. It wasn't there. It was different. So now he's looking out on this new heaven and this new earth. And there's no sea. What is going on here? Well, I, I, I don't like salt water. Um, so I'm not sad. But uh, why no more sea? Uh, what does the sea cover now today, guys? About 70% of the world's surface. So, yeah, yeah, 75, somewhere's in there. So you take the sea out of the picture, you got a lot more property, right? A lot more spaces to roam. Uh, maybe that's it, I don't know. Uh, more spaces to romp in. Uh, Henry Madison Morris, who died in 2006, he was a... He was an awesome guy. If you want to read some fun stuff, Kevin would be right up your aisle. He was an American young earth creationist. He was a Christian apologist and uh, he was an engineer. He was one of the founders of Creation Research Society and, uh, and the, also the Institute of Creation Research, which was big in, when, you know, in the 70s when we were first starting to consider some things. This is what he says about the question of the sea. He says there will, in fact, be no need for a sea on the new earth. The present sea is needed, as was the original Antiluvian Sea, as a basic reservoir for the maintenance of the hydrologic cycle of the water-based ecology and uh, physiology of the animal and human inhabitants of the earth. In English, that means we needed it. In, in King James language, that means at that point we won't anymore. The need for it is gone. That's what the scientist is saying. So, uh, but I think there's more to it than that. As I read John's words here, and there is no more sea. It's as though he was totally taken aback. There was no more sea. He was looking for it and it wasn't there. So to the people of John's time, the sea was a, a mysterious and a dangerous thing. It was mysterious and dangerous. They didn't know what was under it and they didn't know what was on the other side. They didn't have the vision to be able to see past the horizon. It was a place that they, they knew it had the ability to kill them without warning. Remember when they were crossing that sea with the Lord Jesus and the waves were coming? Why would you 
have confidence in the sea after what it had done to them time and again. Remember, I'd say you remember how afraid they were? They were afraid of the sea. So as he's looking out here, then he sees no more sea. So for them, in their time, no fate could be worse than to be swallowed up by the sea and have your body eaten by fish. That was to them the ultimate of the worst way to die. Because nobody would ever find you. Nobody would know what happened to you. You were just gone. You were just gone. I just, from my military days, one of the things I grieve about is our missing in action. They're just gone. We don't know what happened to them. We don't know how they died. We don't know where. And I can understand that the, the families just being totally uh, stressed out over that and having to live with that. In the, in the 20th century, we had almost 100,000 missing in action soldiers, most of which to this day, we still don't know what happened to them. We just don't know. So when they looked at the sea, they had that same kind of a viewpoint. I don't know what happens to somebody when they get sucked under those waters. So he was afraid. So when he looked out that, what do you think he thought then when there was no more sea? Good news, bad news. Good news, right? Probably one of the main sources of that man's fear is not there. It's just gone. I would say then too, for us, the main sources of our fears are gone. They're not there. Just like they aren't for John. And he was amazed by that. But by, I bet he's enjoying it. No more sea. Don't have to do that anymore. They made their lives as fishermen, the most of them. Don't have to work there anymore. Don't have to sort out those rotten old nets. Don't have to do all those things. No more sea. But it also, as you look at how he used the word sea in the rest of the book of Revelation, he, his usage of the sea elsewhere, it designates it as the origin of evil. There are many references where he designates the sea, the picture he's trying to portray, that it's the origin of evil. He also used it to represent the unbelieving nations who persecute God's people. So when he says, no more sea, he's thinking this is good, th good stuff. This is good news. No more sea. And he also uses it symbolically several times. One, I counted one, two, three, four, five, six times to represent the old creation. That is gone, too. So, I mean, it's all new. So he's thought there's no more sea. I just think it's awesome. So John's making a specific point of mentioning that the sea is gone. I think to illustrate that the universe will be completely different. It will not be the same. And to the people of John's time, they would have been very glad to see the sea gone. So John looked for the sea, and he saw beyond it. And we need to see... I think with our spiritual eyes, what is beyond the sea too. Between me and that time, there's this sea of life, you know? And I'm looking past the sea. Sometimes life can become so complicated, so hurtful, so the list goes on, that we lose our perspective about what's over the horizon. That new heaven, that new earth. And like John, being shocked when he got there, he said, no more sea. The scriptures give us the ability today to look beyond the sea of our lives and know what we have out ahead of us. And that's the point of what he's telling us. He wants us to know the plan yes. so we can be confident about what's coming. And let me look and see how far I've got to go. I don't have too far to go. So hang with me a little bit longer because there's a couple of points I want to make uh, so that we start on the millennium study in two weeks. We'll be, we'll be looking at the millennium. The next great thing, Revelation 22.3. Remember what we were talking about with the earth? The ground itself was cursed at the fall. Revelation 22, 3. And there shall be no more curse. And we saw what that curse was. That was Adam um, having hearkened unto the, to the voice of his wife, ate of the tree. Remember what tree that was? Tree of knowledge of good and evil. Uh, which I, he said, which I told you guys not to eat. But you did. So cursed is the ground that you walk on for thy sake. And you guys did it. So the curse is why everything goes wrong in the world and why life is such a fight all the time. It's the curse. We have droughts, earthquakes, hurricanes, tornadoes, fires, floods. I mean, the list goes on. We endure the evils of humanity's sinful nature around the world. Hitler, Stalin, I mean, uh, the, the, you, could, you could make a list as long as your arm and not cover them all. But this all got included in the curse. God gets blamed, but it's not his fault. 
We did it with our sin. So in heaven, Gus's business may be to attend good plants, not eliminating bad plants. In heaven, we can go barefoot across our own yards. In Colorado, you can't do that. So the total work of Christ is nothing less, when I look at it, than to redeem the entire creation from the effects of sin. That's what his plan is, to redeem the entire creation from the effects of our sin. And this is completed in the new earth. That's what the new earth will do. And finally, my last point, is that there is the restoral of all things. It's another R word. The restoral of all things. Look at verse 4 of Revelation 21. And I'm almost done. And I apologize for going so long. But there's a lot of data about you know, this subject. Revelation 21.4 And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Paul explains this for us in his letter to the Ephesians. This whole thing, I make all things new. Ephesians 1, 9 and 10. Having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he hath purposed in himself. Verse 9 of Ephesians 1 says, I have told you my plan. I've told you the engineering approach I'm going to take. Right down through the end of time and where we enter eternity. I've told you all this. That's what he says in verse 9, Ephesians 1. Then in verse 10, that the dispensation of the fullness of times, in that time, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. So Randy Alcorn, in his book on heaven, explains it this way. As Ephesians 1.10 demonstrates, this idea of earth and heaven becoming one is explicitly biblical. Just as the wall that separates God from mankind is torn down in Jesus, so too the wall that separates heaven and earth will be forever demolished. We'll be able to go back and forth. I think it'd be an awesome time. God's plan is that there will be no more gulf between the spiritual and physical worlds. There will be one cosmos, one universe united under God forever. This is the unstoppable plan of God. This is where history is headed. And he is right. He is right. So the entire quote, again, is on your worksheet. So the restored area that I so, as I think about this, look forward to is our ability to be in the presence of God again. And that was lost in the garden. Mankind lost that there. Revelation 21.3, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. That's what we're working toward. He's doing these things so that this verse could be true. He's engineering new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. All those things, all those dominoes that I, that I laid out, all those things coming to, coming to a conclusion so that we can be in his presence. And all this makes me pray more earnestly for how the book ends. Revelation 22, 20. He that testifies these things saith, surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Now, we'll be looking at the millennium, the thousand-year reign of Christ here on earth that starts with his second advent. Uh, in two weeks, we'll start that study. Uh, it would be nice if we could do that study, all of us together in heaven, wouldn't it? Uh, that the Lord would rapture us out of here and life would be good. Uh, if you don't have a personal relationship with the Lord, as you see these plans laid out, don't throw away the opportunity to be part of those plans. Because there's a plan for the other side, too. And it's not nearly as awesome. It is not. I mean, it is, it's, a, it's not a good situation at all. So as you consider these things, consider your relationship with Christ. If you don't have one, he's calling your heart today to make that the case. So answer that call. Uh, let him have your heart. Give him, give him what he wants. Are there any thoughts on new heaven and new earth? Yes, don't, that's... No? Okay. Any bubbles coming up? All right. All right. It's going to be an awesome time, isn't it? And the Lord, as we look at these things, these scriptures, as we go through the Bible, this is a, the Bible is the most intricately planned engineering approach to mankind that I could have ever imagined. And we're peeling the top layer. We're at the 10,000 foot level. 
any of these subjects, and I'm talking particularly now the millennium, you can go as deep as you want because it's all over the scriptures. It's all over. So we'll take a look at that starting in a couple of weeks. All right, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we, we are thankful to you for your plan. Uh, and mostly we're thankful for the confidence that we have now that we have an insight into the plan, uh, that we know what you're up to. We know what you're doing. We know why you're doing it. And we, and we have a general idea of when uh, and all these things take place and how they lay out. And we're, we're asking, Lord, you'd use that as a comfort to our hearts. May we find hope there and, and uh, confidence. May we sleep tonight peacefully, knowing that you've got this whole thing in your hands. And now, Lord, we, we do think about several families that were brought up today that have multiple issues that the old devil is throwing at them all at the same time. And it seems like uh, the more they seek you and the more they want to serve you, the deeper those, uh, those attacks become. We're asking, Lord, for relief from them. May you muzzle the old devil and, uh, and not allow him to have a free reign or reign at all with any of our families. Uh, we're praying, Lord, for them that you would uplift their hearts. May we be the servants in the hands that you need here on earth as we, um, as we go through life together. Now we're praying that you would bless us in all things today, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you.